And now, from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans, we are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word, another edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. And today is Friday, February 11th, 2022, and we do have a powerhouse program, a lot of information, so I'm going to get right into that in our program. We're going to begin where we left off last week, talking about the coming economic tsunami. Early in the week last week, as we taped our program, we crossed into the $30 trillion mark of debt. What does that mean for America and where are we going? We're going to talk about that today. Then I got a very important program segment here called Canada's Heroes, Modern Day Patriots. I'm going to connect this into some of the curses and the warnings and the duality of events that actually, believe it or not, takes us back to pre-war Germany. Wait till you see that segment. And I've got a, this is a very enlightening program for the Sea of Galilee Jesus calms the sea. Now, we all know the story. We've probably heard it since we were ch children in school. But what do you know about the Sea of Galilee? Wait till you see this segment. You're going to love it. And get the kids ready for that one. All righty, let's begin with this. You just can't make this stuff up. Here we go. Government equality support. Let's make everybody equal. And we're also going to do it for the poor crack addicts. <laughs> you're not gonna you're not gonna believe this the US now is helping the addict the Biden administration is going to fund crack pipe distribution to advance racial equality to do that we're gonna put out 30 million dollars to provide smoking kits to the vulnerable communities if you can't afford your habit that's okay the government here to help so not only are they providing, as we brought out in previous programs, a place to go and use your drugs so you don't overdose, but just keep you on them. Now we're going to give you the paraphernalia to be able to supply it in case you don't have the money to. How about that? You know, I saw this program. I, I, I was like, when in the world? You know, God talks about taking the mind away from our leadership. We did this for our youth. Remember our youth when they're going to fix the problem with the, the sexual abuse and the immorality? They began to provide the youth ways to have contraceptives. Well, the next step was, of course, that doesn't work. Now they provide a way to have abortions in some cities and some schools without ever telling the parents. So how is that working? How do you think it's going to work here when you continue to supply the means and the ability to continue to stay in a drug problem. Now think about this. Once they're finished and they're high, they turn them loose to the streets. God says we're a sick and immoral society. He is absolutely right. All right, let's get into another one. Climate change. Earth's black box. I thought this was quite interesting because... We've kind of resolved ourselves to the fact that it's going to be coming to the end of the world. And it's like nobody really wants to figure out how to do it except to begin to blame climate change. Take a look at this video and I'll be right back. Black box could record the end of the world. The Earth's black box will store data pertaining to climate change and how governments act or don't. Earth Black Box is a structure and device um, that will record every step that humanity takes uh, towards or away from um, the impending climate catastrophe. Its algorithm will scour the internet and store climate change data, which its creators hope will both hold governments accountable and serve as a record for future generations. If the worst is to happen and, and uh, you know, as a civilization, we, we do crash as a result of climate change. Um, this indestructible box will, will be there um, and will record every detail of that, every inaction and, and action that we take towards that. So whoever's left or whoever finds it afterwards um, learns from, from our mistakes and, and doesn't make them again. The roughly 33 foot long steel box will be built in 2022 on the west coast of Tasmania. It will be solar powered and built to withstand natural disasters. It was first thought of by Clevenger BBDO, a creative agency in Australia, which is collaborating with the University of Tasmania. All the data that's being 
um, reported is, is open sourced and available to everyone online to, to look at. Um, all the data will also be used as an educational tool at schools and, and universities. Um, so yes, it, it, it is a learning tool and, and hopefully something that will will ensure that we don't need it to be an indestructible um, black box in the end. Um, so it has a it has a couple of uses. Yeah, I'm, I'm I am hoping that um, it, it it has a, a happy ending and we're not just <laughs> building this for for the worst. <laughs> I love it. So we're going to record how we all die, but for those who might live through it or next society comes back later, they can at least look in here and see what it was that caused the problem. I want to ask you something. I mean, I know I'm being light hearted about this, but I just think it's insane. I wonder if they put in part of the scriptures, Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, that talks about the blessings and the curses that God brings for disobedience that brings about what the world calls as climate change. I bet we won't find that in that box. All right, so now let's pick up where we were last week and we bring about the problem that we're talking about now with climate change. This brought a lot of, uh, of uh, interest, uh, emails and phone calls when I asked this question, what caused the Israelites to go into captivity the first time into Egypt? Well, we all understand that Joseph, we've seen the movie, uh, the, the Exodus, uh, I mean the Ten Commandments where Moses has to come back to Egypt and grab the Israelites and bring them to God on the mount. Remember that? And they got the Ten Commandments. So what led them into that captivity state the first time in, in ancient, for ancient Israel? Well, the answer is actually climate change. Because remember, it was the seven years of famine when the whole world had nowhere to eat. So everybody went to Egypt to survive, including the children of Israel. So while the world teaches its climate change, God shows what brings about these problems is, is sin. And we all know that it was Joseph who originally was sold out by his brothers, originally going to put him in a well, they were going to kill him. And they decided, well, we can at least make some money off of this. And they sold him to a caravan, brought him to Egypt. Well, God provided the way for Israel to be saved through Joseph. But it was the actual sin of them who brought Joseph into that captivity state. And that's what's going on right now is that God is providing a way for His people so that when the rest of the world has their problems, God has provided a way for salvation through His people of called out ones. So we're going through the same process. The world understands that things are getting really bad, and that's why we had that black box. Because they say, listen, things are coming down really, really bad around the world. So now, the seven years of famine, what we con call climate change, is actually being brought about by disobedience to God and God taking away his blessings of what's going on around the world. And people don't believe that's possible, but if you look at the book of Job, yeah, I absolutely understand it because remember Satan's contending with God and he's talking about Job. God says, have you considered my servant Job? And, and God says, and he tells uh, Satan, well, he's only in that state of, uh, of saved states, so to speak, are protected. He says, because you've got a hedge of protection all around him. But take away that hedge and then see what happens. So what happens? Well, you see tornadoes and wars going against Job's family. Remember, all that took place. Well, that is what's going on right now. As God removes his hedge of protection off this planet, you're beginning to see Satan's wrath beginning to strike out in all of these catastrophes that goes on around the world. That's exactly what's going on today. So now, let's ask another question now. All right? The Bible speaks about another time event even earlier than the children of Israel that the world today would call climate change. I'm going to give you a second or two to think about it. I don't want to give the answer. I'm looking here at our crew. See how many people's got any answers. We need that Jeopardy music to come up right about now, thinking about it. Any ideas on, the, on one before the children of Israel for climate change? I'm waiting for the crew now to see if we've got any answers. No answers. Amazing. How about this? When was that time in the Bible? Noah's flood. Noah's flood. I mean, what better prime example than Noah's flood 
for climate change. That changed the entire world. Look at Genesis 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What was the result of that sin? Climate change. <laughs> Interesting. You begin to look at it from a biblical perspective, take it away from the news media and put it back to where it rightly belongs, the truth and understanding of God. All right, how about this? The coming economic tsunami. Let's pick up this and get a little more serious now. U.S. debt. All right, U.S. debt just topped $30 trillion. What can we expect? Where is that taking us to today? Let's talk about that on the U.S. debt. All right, here's our debt chart. Now, we brought this out to you uh, a week or two ago, this debt chart that you're looking up on the screen right now shows with a block around it at $29.818 trillion. All right, that was on January 20th of this year at noon. All right, you, you got that? Oh, keep, an, keep an idea on that date, January 20th, 2022. Just a couple weeks later, the U.S. debt now exceeds $30 trillion. This came out on the, on the Wall Street. It's the increase from a pre-pandemic levels fueled by trillions of dollars spent on aid programs for small business and workers and others. So debt is out of control. This was a clock on February 6, 2020, $30 trillion and $14 billion. Now, the difference of that is, to give you an idea, in just that little bit of time, is $197 billion increase in debt in just 17 days. That brings our debt growing to $11.5 billion a day of debt. Just debt. Unbelievable, but that's what we're looking at. Through the course of the, of the year, the per day, per hour, per minute, it all varies depending on when they put money into the account that they're collecting from the revenue and the government and the taxes for, the, for the, state, the government itself. But that would be an average of what we're looking at and where we're going. So what does that mean? All right, what does that mean? Take a look at this box here, U.S. debt. In, and in this box it says the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, predicted that it would not occur $30 trillion till 2025. Now, we just entered 2022. But just two years ago, in 2020, the, the Congressional Budget Office said that at the rate we were going, pre-pandemic now, that we would hit that $30 trillion in 2025. We have now hit that three years earlier. In other words, our debt, our problems, and, and no solution, is now moving at an escalated pace that we haven't been to ever. So what does that mean for the United States? Where are we going? I'm going to show you a chart that we brought out in 2020, and then just last year in August of 2021, I did a, a sermon, and we showed in that sermon what they just brought out in the news this week, that we believed that the debt clock had moved up Three years, and we showed that last year in August. How did God give us that information in advance that now is coming out about five or six months later? Let's go through and let's take a look at that. U.S. net national debt is likely to nearly double to 202% of the GDP by 2051, the CBO projects. What does that mean? What does that mean to you and I, the the debt percentage versus gross domestic product. The GDP, when you look at it, the gross domestic product is simply put as how much money can the United States produce and take in for the government? That's called your GDP. If you took in all your earnings so the government evaluates that, it's called the GDP. That is a period of, of, uh, of time, of percentage, of income coming in and going out. Because of the large deficits, the federal debt held by the public is projected to grow from 81% of GDP in 2020, now keep that in mind, I got that highlighted in yellow, to 98% in 2030, the highest percentage since 1946. What happened in 1946? We had just came out of World War II. 
That's when everything the United States did was projected to stop the war, went into the war, the highest debt percentages of uh, versus the income that the United States ever had. And from that time, it started easing itself back down. In other words, we had to spend more than we took in, consume extra debt to be able to resolve the issue of the war. Well, since that time, we've never been back to a, a percentage of that range again until now. Until now. In a peacetime era, we have now exceeded the debt of a wartime era. By 2050, the debt would be 202% of GDP. That, when they brought that out just a few months ago, is already outdated. It's already outdated. It's going to grow beyond that by 2050 if we allow things to go. Let's, let's talk about that. The U.S. debt versus the GDP. This is very important. The GDP grew 21% between the, the end of 2008 and the end of 2010. All right, so we're talking just a little over a couple of years back in what they call the Great Recession that had happened in our day. Remember in 2008, just about the whole world economy is just about collapsed. So the GDP, it grew by 21%. So now they're saying that we estimate the debt now, we're talking about the debt of the GDP growing. The debt will grow a similar amount in over just seven month period of time. So what we're talking about, the percentage of debt that grew in 2008 to the percentage of debt that's gonna grow now, what took two years to do in 2008, now is only going to take, take seven months. So here's what I'm showing you to try to make sense of all this. There might be a lot of figures and numbers and say, well, I don't understand all that. If you didn't understand economics, you might have a hard time comprehending all of it. But the bottom line is this, is that you can't outlive and keep going when your debt keeps growing. At some point, there's a price to be paid. Well, right now, the government just keeps pushing it down the line. So now what we're looking at is that we're seeing an accelerated pace. Is, is like is, there's a sense of urgency. There's, there's a warning. There's a, a, a sense of finality coming that many in the economics can see. We brought out last week how the billionaires began selling last, last uh, year in 2021 and then beginning in January, and the people who have all the money, they know there's things that's happening right now. So they're dumping a lot of the money, the billionaires or by the billions, you know, 60, 70, 80 billions of dollars that they're selling of their stock to get out of the market because they don't know what's gonna happen this year. Meanwhile, the debt continues to grow at a faster pace than it ever grew. So by the time they bring you the report of where we are, it's already outdated. All right, that's what this all means here. So now let's go a little further. The GDP grew to over 100% of GDP by the end of the fiscal year 2020. They had no idea it was going to do that. All right, and that happened in October 1st. So that means they still had October, November, and December still to go in 2020. And they already exceeded 100% of GDP. What that's telling us is that, is that our debt is growing faster than we can put money in. All right, it's called the Miski moment. It's the Miski moment is when you reach the point that your money that you're paying in can't even cover the interest that you're paying on your debt you already have. I've got a video here. Take a look at this video. It talks about how good we're doing with our GDP. Play that video. Joining us now is someone who does know a thing or two about economic policy, former chairman of the Office of Economic Advisors and a member of President Obama's cabinet. Professor Austin Goolsby. Professor, thank you for joining us. The debt seems to go up no matter who's in control of Congress or the White House. Is that because the alternative is just too painful? I think the one thing to remember is that as the debt goes up, our GDP is also going up. So what we, what we most want to do is try to stabilize, let's call it the ratio of debt to GDP. We're, we're not doing that. You know, that, that, that ratio's also been going up lately. But you can have a totally manageable size debt, even one that's growing, as long as the economy's growing. If the economy stops growing, that's when the, that's when the, music, you know, the music stops and everybody got to find a chair. 
All right, Professor, you're the perfect person to answer this question. I was speaking in Florida a couple of days ago. I asked the audience how many of them want a balanced budget amendment. They want to balance the budget tomorrow. Every hand went up. Can you give the viewers a sense of what would be required to actually balance the budget next year on a federal level? Well, boy, if you tried to balance it in one year, um, it would require massive doubling, tripling of taxes and abolish the Defense Department, abolish Social Security, abolish Medicare, you know, you know, that kind of thing. The only thing I'll say when people, what people want is fiscal responsibility. They want to know that we're on a path that is sustainable. That's a little different than just balancing the budget. The government is not really like, it's, it's not like your checkbook. Um, and so if, if you had a balanced budget amendment, and then when you had a recession, okay, so when COVID hit and Donald Trump was in the White House, the deficit soared to a record level because we have automatic stabilizers. A yeah, balanced budget amendment would force you to have to raise taxes and cut spending when things like COVID hit. So it's actually not a great idea, um, but the fiscal rectitude and a, and a sustainable path, that's what we should aim for. Now, I don't know what you took out of that video, but, but let me see if I can unwrap that just a little bit. He was trying to explain that the United States doesn't operate like your checkbook, and it doesn't. It really doesn't. You see, in your checkbook, if you don't have any money to pay your bills, you can't go in your back closet and print more. The United States just goes and prints more. Then they go to the government and say, hey, we need to up, up the debt. And so it has all these little things that trigger and kick in and keep everything operating. Sure, because you know why? Because you're bankrupt, whether you realize it or not. So basically, that's what we're looking. So now, take a look what I just brought up. Let's put that up on the screen, Jeff. In that, let's just keep that up while I'm talking here. Now, while we're looking at this, I showed you a second uh, ago about the $29 trillion in debt on January 20th. Now, let's go to at the bottom of that box and talk about what you just heard in that video where he talked about it's okay to have debt as long as the GDP is growing. And the GDP is growing. But now take a look at the bottom box. In 1960, the GDP to, to debt was 53%. They began, that's coming down off of 106% in World War II. By 1980, they had the GDP versus debt down to 34. By 2000 now, it began moving back up again at 59. Look what the GDP versus the national debt is at today. 127%. Now, he also said people want fiscal responsibility. So he, he, the reason he was hesitating and stuttering, he's trying to put lipstick on a pig to make it look better. But you can't. Because he knows, because he's an economic professor at a university teaching our young. And where we're at now, we are beyond sustainable. We have passed the point of repair. You cannot fix this. You cannot produce enough goods now to simply even pay for the debt. More debt is coming. The supply chain problems, we brought this out last week. The inflation that's coming. And the big, the, this is the elephant in the room, the global oil prices that continue to rise that they expect to be double what they are by 2023. Oil now has extend, extended in over $90 a barrel. It actually touched into 92 just a week ago. It's drifted back just a little bit, and it's going to continue to do that. It's risen $0.28, cents, Texas Intermediate, to 90.55. This was last week. It's gained $2.01 and, and from the previous day settlement. That's in just one day. The president and his administration on day one began to wreck the stability of this nation by cutting off its supply of oil. Everything centers around oil, Every, our food supply, uh, everything we get in, our truckers, you name it, it all is built around oil. So we have moved from a society that was sustainable, that kept everything balanced through our oil, to shutting everything down and having to go buy and be dependable to other countries again. That is absolutely insane. 
We began talking about a little bit of this in August 2021. I'm going to bring out a chart from back then. Let's talk about this in light of the national debt. 2020, the nation in collapse. We brought this out, a nation in crisis in August of 2021. All right, so now, this is in January 2020. Everything began to change as COVID was ushered in. Before the year was over, it brought riots, burnings, nationwide looting, businesses being closed, schools closed, lockdowns, and trillions of dollars in new debt. Now, we showed you this change. This is what we believed we were, what the government just told us we are now. We brought this out in August. This is the chart that we brought in from Roaring Seas many years ago now, I guess five years ago, showing that 2014, 2015 with the blood moons, the tetrads, and how it began to move to where the world believed the end of the world now was 2030 because of climate change. Now we've got a black box who's going to record it all for us. 2017 was the heavenly signs. We talked about that. Then we went into our three and a half year period showing that, that God's bringing things out and showing that the possibility of a seven year cycle, which actually began in 2021, that's actually going to end up in 2022. Now, this is the point that I brought this to that you've got up on your screen right now. 2024 is called the Miski moment. Of, it's called debt zero. Right? That's the bottom line. That is when all your money that you bring in can't pay for the interest on the debt. All right. So we brought that out. Now, keep that in mind. We began asking the questions, where are we going to be in the seven years of plenty uh, and then begin our seven years of lean, bringing us about to 2031, which is to actually a prophecy of about the time Christ is going to be coming back to this planet. All right. So then we talked about Satan's removal. All of these things all tie in together. And this is a this is a puzzle that we've been building for the last seven now going into eight years. But with COVID, it began to unwrap several other things that we needed to consider, all right? because we don't know the day or the hour. What we're trying to do is evaluate the conditions of this world in light of Bible prophecy. So now, if we went back to where we see the warnings of the blood moons seven years, we get to the stage of what happened at the next election. That's what we looked at in 2020 and 21. Now we've got a situation here where the Minsky moment in the COVID crisis of 2020 all began to merge, all right, because the debt began moving up. So something happened. We believed what we were looking at right here is that the Minsky moment was moved from 2024 to 2021. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, just told us that's what's happened. So in other words, by looking at God's word, evaluating what he tells us to look at in advance before it happens, God leads us to understand where we are in the time elements in the end of days. Now, that ought to be awful comforting to people to know, because if we can believe and see that, then we'll also understand that he will not leave us defenseless. In other words, we don't need a black box out there to record the end of the world. We need to look up to heaven and God to look down on us, to grant us his protection and guide us through those end of days and to continue to present that warning message. The U.S. was passing bills and spending multi-trillions of dollars. Never in history has man ever seen so much being done. So if the seven years of plenty were moved up, so were the seven years of lean. So now it lines up was really, really good. Now we began to see the seven-year cycles all coming into play. It's amazing what God has done through that all. Are we in our beginning of our seven years of lean? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us we have seven years of lean. But when you look at the seals, we know they're going to be years of lean. We only use the term seven years of lean because we understand the plan of God as a former and a latter, a physical, and a spiritual. So when we look at the former, when God had to come grab his children out of captivity, they had seven years of lean. So God says, look at the time when you see beginning to see things wane and lean, which we are now, then you'll know that the time has begun. So now, 
With the lean comes crisis, and that's what we're looking at around the world, especially here in the United States. 2021, with the collapse like it was on steroids. Look, Isaiah 1, 5, and 6. The whole head is sick, the heart is faint, the soul from the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. On January 20, 21, there came the election. 1 Corinthians says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And it appears, and, and this is not a Republican, a Democratic point of view, but if you look at the decisions of this administration, you can only come to the conclusion that God has removed the wisdom of our leadership. Everything they have touched has gone down a tube, has brought curses and not blessings. Even the left sees that now. All right, let's move on. All right, here we go. World Watch. Canada's heroes. I want, to, I want to draw a couple of connections here that you may have never considered that we're looking at today in light of Bible prophecy of former and latter. Let's talk about that with our Canadian heroes. Modern day patriots, the Canadian truckers today. <clears throat> you know, as I was watching it and seeing the news, this is what came to my mind. It's like, it's like the, the, our American Boston Tea Party. <laughs> You remember when they rebelled against the taxes? No taxation without representation. Remember that? Well, here it's like your freedoms are being taken away. And the truckers, they've had enough. So let's bring out the story of the truckers in Canada. All right. Thousands joined the protest in Canada against the COVID vaccine mandates. Ottawa declares a state of emergency amidst continuing blockades and raucous protests over COVID measures. The supporters joined the so-called Freedom Convoy, as they call themselves, of truckers and drivers in Ottawa for demonstrations against public health mandates. Well, now it's beginning to take place even here in the United States. What's going on there? The Ottawa mayor said, we are losing the battle. <laughs> I love that. They're losing the battle. But they ain't going down without a fight. That's, they're not going to go down. The Ottawa mayor, Jim Watson, pleaded for help, saying the authorities were outnumbered and were losing this battle against the demonstrators. Throughout the protest, people had been seen lugging gas cans to keep the blockade of trucks and engines running. Well, now, this is, this is absolutely crazy. But now they're trying to say that's illegal, you can't bring them gas. They're saying it's illegal, you can't bring them food while they're there. If you do, they said they're going to begin to arrest you. What a, hypocr a hypocrisy is taking place. On CNN yesterday and on, on many of the left-wing channels, they began to bring the support to the Canadian government and saying that these are nationwide insurrections. And now they're trying to bring law to arrest all these truckers. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. The city's police department also warned on Sunday that anyone attempting to bring material support to the truckers, including gasoline, would be subject to arrest. They have a right to protest, don't they? Well, at least that's what the left has told us in the past. Take a look at this one. This is another part of, of Canada. Over 600 trucks in that convoy. There's other areas of Canada that they're blocking the getting into Canada or leaving Canada because of these restrictions. Now let's talk about that hypocrisy I mentioned. There's a requirement that foreign nationals entering the U.S. and Canada be vaccinated of COVID-19 in the exasperating the supply of the chain logjam, according to the freight industry groups who say they can't find enough vaccinated drivers to bring the goods across the U.S. and Canadian borders. Is this honestly about the vaccine? All of these mandates. Well, let's take a look at that. Here's something from the Center for Immigration Studies. Nearly two million illegals have crossed our U.S. border and released into the U.S. In the US without COVID tests of vaccines. So now, in what they're saying 
in the border now, and the United States is joining in with Canada saying this is all illegal. They have to have support because they have to have the vaccines to keep everybody locked down. Well, if that's the case, why did we let nearly two million people cross our border in the south without a vaccine? Is it really about the vaccine? The migrants waiting at the U.S.-Mexican borders at risk of coronavirus, this is according to U.S. USA Today, the experts warned. In other words, there's all, there have been warnings coming across, but nobody's doing anything. The Biden orders most U.S. workers to get vaxxed, but they did not, and even Jen Psaki at, at a news report could not answer the question, well, if everybody has to be vaxxed, how come you're not mandating that the illegals coming in from Mexico have to be vaxxed. They're exempted from it. And you know, many of the U.S. border agents now have caught COVID from the illegals. They have a real shortage of, supply, of manpower to supply the needs for that part of the region. Now, it gets a little bit more sticky now. The GoFundMe... There was a go. Everybody knows about GoFundMe now. The GoFundMe account seizes the truckers' money. Around the globe, especially in the United States, they're looking at what the truckers are trying to do, and they want to give them support. They raised on GoFundMe ten million dollars. Are you with me on this? Ten million dollars. Ted Cruz launched an investigation into GoFundMe. Why? Because they seized the, fund, the truckers $10 million. They initially reported they're going to take that $10 million and give it to charities of their choice. I first heard the story and said, that's theft. That's theft. Well, that's what they're going to do now. They're going to look into it, Ted Cruz says, because this is criminal activity. The Canadian truckers are heroes, Cruz says. Senator Cruz said to Fox News today, I sent a letter to the Federal Trade Commission asking that the FTC open an investigation into the GoFundMe into whether they've committed deceptive trade practices. I got that on videotape. Let's play that now. Got to switch gears and talk about big tech censorship and your efforts to stop what's going on for the truckers. Uh, there's been censorship of their convoy in Canada. And also Facebook has removed their page for a D.C. rally. These truckers uh, raised money in a GoFundMe uh, situation. And the GoFundMe uh, officials said, well, you want to protest a vaccine? We're going to seize your $10 million that you raised. Can you imagine? People donate to GoFundMe because they are donating to a certain cause. GoFundMe thought nothing of saying we're going to seize the $10 million and give it to the charities that we want to give it to until they had to backtrack. What are you going to do about it? Well, listen, it, it, it is theft on the part of GoFundMe. Let me say the Canadian truckers are heroes. They are patriots and they are marching for your freedom and for my freedom. They, they are those truck drivers that God bless them. They're defending Canada, but they're defending America as well. That is that is courage on display that the government doesn't have the right to force you to comply to their arbitrary mandates and they're standing up for freedom. And of course, big government hates it and is trying to crush them. Of course, the corporate media hates it and is trying to silence them. And big tech, you look at what GoFundMe did. People gave $10 million to support the Freedom Convoy because they were so proud of the courage of these truck drivers. And, and the thieves in Silicon Valley decided, we don't like your politics. So A, we're going to take your money. And then B, we're going to give it to people we like. Listen, if, if anyone else did that, that is called theft. And, and so today, uh, I sent a letter to the Federal Trade Commission asking that the FTC open an investigation into GoFundMe into whether they've committed deceptive trade practices because when people gave money, they gave money under the promise it would go to the Freedom Convoy, not to whatever left-wing political ideology GoFundMe and yeah. other Silicon Valley companies support. They are deceiving right. consumers and it is... All right, so we're looking at, honestly, we're looking at theft. At the very least, they need to investigate conspiracy because there's not just one person who makes that decision that we're just going to confiscate that $10 million and give it to somebody else. And the bad thing about this, too, is they're not 
forwarding it on to the truckers where it was originally supposed to go. They said they'll give it back to the people who gave it. Well, that means they, they, they've accomplished their job. It doesn't go to the people who are supposed to get it. All right, so that's the beginning. Now, let's take this to another level. Let's take that. That's what the world sees and that's what the world understands. And that is true. That is what's going on. But see, God tells us we're supposed to see things through a spiritual lens. All right, so we're supposed to look at it through things that God brings us out in his eyes. So let me share with you something else that's going on right now with the Caesars. Did you ever see what took place last year? This is in the occupied territory up in the west, Seattle. Remember that? But it took six blocks and that became their ground. Where they, every night they had riots and they were trying burning down the police stations and courthouses. All right, so that platform, the same people who said this is illegal what the truckers are doing, raised money to give to them and to even get them out of jail when they broke the law. So what we're looking at, it isn't about COVID. It isn't about mandates. It's about control. All right, it's about control to silence the right, what's going on here. Because, see, that's pretty much the right who's speaking up and saying, look, we're not going to have this. We're here for freedom. We're not a socialist society. All right? You with me on that? So now, let's get into the nuggets portion of our program of this, of this one segment. Pre-war Germany in silencing the opposition. This is very important. Remember, I've, been, I've said this now to you, and you're going to probably get tired of hearing me say this. There's a former and there's a latter. There's a physical and there's a spiritual. So what we're looking at is a former now physical event that's now taking place in our day as a latter in a spiritual way. All right. So with that laid, let me tell you this. It was called when they began to silence the right. Aryanization. It was the forced expulsion of Jews from the economic life in Nazi Germany. There's two phases that we're looking at in Germany and now here in America. There's a silencing and then there's an underground current to seize the finances and the resources of those they want to silence. The latter on the second is an openness of abuse and taking things that doesn't belong to them with the support of the government. All right, that, that, that's clear? So now let's, let's tell you what's going on. Aryanization was the forced expulsion of the Jews from economic life in Nazi Germany. It entailed the transfer of Jewish property into Aryan or non-Jewish hands. What did we just look at with... GoFundMe. What did they do? They didn't agree with the right. You have no right to take your money and your voice and give it to those truckers. We're going to seize it and give it to who we want to give it to. The only difference for the truckers, they're not wearing a Jewish star in our day. Let's get a little further into this. Aryanization is, according to Krutz, Mueller, and Sultan, in the, the book, The Disposition or the Plundering of German Jewry is a Nazi slogan that was used to camouflage theft and its political consequences. All right, so that's what's going on here. It, it obscures the theft and it makes it legal is what's going on. In the broader sense, the term Aryanization is sometimes used to refer to the eviction of Jewish scientists, businesses, in culture. In other words, the mindset, the wisdom, the knowledge, and the support means to keep a free nation going is removed first. Now, we've been seeing that here in the United States. It began in Germany in 1933 and went all the way through to the end of the war. The process started in 1933 in Nazi Germany with the transfers of Jewish property and ended up with the Holocaust. When when Hitler took power in 1933, it began to illegally take place to allow Jews to have businesses. Many of the Jews owned newspapers. 
they were forbidden to have a newspaper. It was legally transferring everything into the government of Germany, which was Hitler, a socialist society. Isn't it interesting today that what we're fighting is that we're fighting a socialist society who wants to take over the United States. And the Democrats are calling themselves the Democratic Socialist Party. In Germany, it was called the, the German Socialist Party. I mean, the, the parallels is unbelievable what's going on. The two phases have generally been identified as the first phase in which the theft from Jewish victims was concealed under a veneer of legality. The second phase was the property of more openly confiscation. Now, what I was seeing with, with the GoFundMe is beginning of the second phase. Unless somebody steps up and say, hey, you don't have a legal right to take that money. They would have gotten away with it. Now, we're at the beginning of that stage. So here, we have been witnessing this same pattern here in America. Now, what has not been brought out, but when you put it in the comparison of the duality of events is this. The intrusion was by the IRS and the conservatives, particularly the Tea Party. When the Tea Party began to rise up and they used their funds and their businesses to have a voice to put people in office who would support their point of view in government. After all, we are a free government, a free society, are we not? The IRS began to get into their tax statements and began to shut them down and confiscate their belongings. You don't believe it can happen? It happened because, you see, the IRS has admitted they did it. They have lost lawsuits and admitted, beginning to have to return some of those things. But by this time, it's too late for many of those people to be restored. That has been going on little by little over the last eight to ten years. We have just seen with the GoFundMe the beginning of the second phase to be able to come in as a government or as a business in control and say, you don't have a right to take that, it's mine. And then begin to get support with it. And the fact that all the left-wing news media stations are now supporting the government to say that these truckers are wrong, they have no right to do it, and if you try to help them, we're going to shut you down and put you in jail, is a promotion and support to the second phase of what's coming to take away the belongings of those who oppose and raise their voice against the government. We're looking at that going on right now. The advancement and the silencing of the right wing via large media controlled businesses aligned to the government. The GoFundMe is the first bold step into the second phase of a modern day left Aryanization in this nation. Now that is the biblical point of view going into where we are today. This is a very important story and one that we will stay on top of as we go forward. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to go look at the Sea of Galilee and Jesus calms the sea. Let's gather our thoughts, let's grab our emotions, let's settle down, and let's take a look at Love Is. And I'll be right back.
All right, great little videos. All right, welcome back to everybody. <clears throat> All right, let's get into our Nuggets portion of the program today. Sea of Galilee and Jesus calmed the sea. This is the actual scriptures where you can read that. Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27. It's a story we all know. I want to bring to you a video piece today that talks a little bit about that from a totally different perspective. I came across this a few weeks back, and this is from Sergio and Rhonda in Israel, and I found that little website, and, and I, it was interesting because I never thought about the sea. We always think about Jesus in the boat, and he's asleep, and the, the uh, apostles around him are scared to death and wake up, you know, we're all going to die. But take a look at this video. It gives us a, a, a little more insight into the Sea of Galilee. And then I'll be right back. Well, we'll be right back because it's about eight minutes long. Let's play the video. We're standing at the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And behind us is a very big storm coming our way. And it's going to get here in just a few minutes. And Rod and I want to see if this storm can cause waves large enough to flip over a boat. A boat such as the disciples would have been on 2,000 years ago when Jesus calmed the storm. Are you excited? I'm nervous. <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> I don't want to stick around for this. But it's also cool at the same time. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. Yeah, let's see what happens. Today, we're going into a storm in the Sea of Galilee. And we want to do that because of two reasons. Number one, this is about the famous miracle that is recorded in the Bible where Jesus calms this giant storm. A storm that is so big that the disciples were afraid they're going to drown. Which leads us to reason number two. The Sea of Galilee is not known to have big storms or high waves. In fact, most people who live here in their entire lifetime have never seen high waves. And there is a good reason for that. The Sea of Galilee is not a sea by any normal definition. It is rather a very small lake, measuring only 13 miles long by 7 miles wide. In comparison, it is 15,000 times smaller than the Mediterranean Sea, which is a real sea, by the way. So given its small size, it is very unlikely to see high waves here, because high waves would require a rather extreme storm which fortunately is very rare in this area. And that's because the Sea of Galilee is located 700 feet below the sea level. Well, the real sea level. This makes this area warmer and more protected from the storms. And to make things even sweeter, it sits at the northern edge of the Jordan Rift Valley, a depression area that is known for its warm weather, lack of rain and lack of storms. So if you've been to Israel before, chances are this lake was as calm as a cat. And that's because this is what it's like all year round. Which brings us here today. When my dad sent me a message saying a big storm is coming, in fact it's so big that they're closing down some districts and schools in the area. So Rhoda and I thought this could be a rare opportunity to witness the legendary high waves and capture them on camera. Look how fast the clouds cover the city of Nazareth. This is, this is crazy. This is a big storm. Wow, I can't see the lake yet. It looks like we were able to get ahead of the storm and arrive at the northern shore of Sea of Galilee, but the visibility is deteriorating fast. So we decided to park by the ancient city of Capernaum and get down to the shore on foot. All right, let's park right here. We're the only people here. Yeah. All right. This is exciting. Uh, oh, wow. Whoa. Wow. Whoa, look Wait. what happened. What happened here? What? What it is didn't this? look like this before. What happened? That's insane. Wait, what was here before? It was like vegetation and trees? The water would come right up here and it would go all the way out there. It's like half of this land is gone. Oh I wonder if some gosh. kind of storm before this came and just took this big chunk of land out. Oh gosh. Wow. Whoa. Oh, I feel it coming. Do you feel it coming? Obviously, these are not the high waves that we were looking for. 
but that's only because the storm hasn't arrived here just yet. I'm saying these waves are very small right now, but they can get way, way bigger. Even though this is rare, it is certainly not the first time that a storm hits the lake. Just a year ago, a singer-songwriter, Filippo Rossi, who is also known by his stage name Nothing Less, was able to capture this footage from a pier, located just a few hundred feet away from where Rhoda and I are standing today. And while this might look severe, we should first assess the height of the waves by using a reference object, such as the railing. Because we know that the approximate height of the rails is about 4 feet, we can take this measurement, drag it to the lowest point of the wave, and estimate that the height of the wave is about the same, 4 feet. And so while this water looks unusual for us, it certainly does not look big enough to make professional fishermen be scared for their lives. But luckily, we were able to gain access to another footage. The year 1992. When a famous Israeli director, Moshe Alpert, captures one of the greatest storms ever recorded on tape in the Sea of Galilee. And if we use the same analysis method, we can estimate that the height of the waves to be as high as 10 feet. On smaller boats, waves this high can definitely be considered life-threatening, even for experienced fishermen. We can imagine this stormy, windy, rainy, and Jesus with disciples on a boat. And here the disciples are panicking, probably cold. <laughs> waves, 2 meters high, 15 feet high, uh, not 15, 10 feet high waves. Yeah. And it probably was very scary. You can't put your sail up because the gush is probably going to flip, flip, you. flip <laughs> you over. And you are stuck in the middle of this lake and you're, you're panicking. And there's Jesus. Who just says, be still quiet. Commands the winds to stop, the storm to stop. Marvelous. We came here today hoping to see the large waves in person. But it seems like this storm is just not big enough for that. Nonetheless, we're thankful. Thankful for the people who were kind enough to provide us with their videos from the previous years, especially the rare storm of 1992. This footage gives us a great visual perspective of the violent waves that would have battered the boat of the disciples 2,000 years ago when Jesus calmed the storm. No matter how big the storm may be, whether it is on the Sea of Galilee or a tornado on its way for destruction or a personal struggle that is too heavy to carry, remember, if we believe, we may find that peace by calling on Jesus, who rebuked the storm and said to the sea, quiet. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I saw that. I said, I've got to share this with everybody. Next time you read about that, when you see what Jesus Christ just gets up and basically says, be calm, stop. He gets calm. He goes back to sleep. <laughs> amazing. Add that to your arsenal of insight into the Bible. All right, let's begin to wrap it up now. This is from the Home Office on February 11th. This was in the mail last week, and don't, don't forget, if you're new to our program, you can sign up for our newsletter, and we'll send you a newsletter and a DVD offering every single month. We'll also be sending you uh, videos uh, with an offering every single month. The videos that went out this week were 
the NNI on part two of the Twelfth Night connection to Mardi Gras and the repairing of the breach. I hesitated for a second because I couldn't remember what part it was that we sent out. I had to go looking for it just now. All right, that was part two. We also mailed out just two weeks ago in the mail our monthly newsletter for February in this month's offering the DVD, The Biblical Mystery to the Battle of New Orleans. But be sure to write for both, but you don't have to wait. You can go to the website and you can begin to watch that DVD right now. So be sure to do that. All right, that's it for our program today. A lot of information, some concerning things, but you know we're in God's hands and He says He will protect us. As we do every week, let's close our program with a more uplifting video. And today's video is Restore Us, Psalm 85. Take a look. We'll be right back to close our program. Well, that's it for our program today. Isn't that a great video? Upbeat, bouncing on your feet. Psalm 85, restore us. All right, that's it for our program today. Hope you enjoyed it. A lot of information. You might want to go back and take a look at it again. And don't forget, as we tell you every single week, be sure to share this with everyone you know. They're going to love you for it. Or not. Till next week, God be with you.